you grew up in Brooklyn, in that area. What was? What are your first memories of, of the music that you loved? Did you did you listen to ABC and MCA and those stations that the New York radio stations back in those days? Well, in Brooklyn it was Williamsburg, and I grew up right across the street from the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And my first recollection was sailors and and women in you know those really crazy fifties fashions and. Half of it, one block was Italian, the other Spanish, and the other was Hasidic, which was really exotic to me because the men, of course, looked dressier than the women. You know, it was like a punk look, but I didn't realize it was punk then. But I was very attracted to that look. You know, the white socks, the short pants. And, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, mostly sailors, and 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 um, and the guy that lived upstairs from me was, um, you know, Italian. We were all Italian families, and. Um, and the lady that took care of me, her husband was a psychic, so I just, the visual was pretty intense. It was always like, you know, the wall of saints, and everyone would come to him to find out what was going to happen. And his, it was supposed to call him Sitsi Pauli, but I yes. couldn't pronounce it. Basically, my sister couldn't. So whatever my sister Ellen did, I did. She was a year yeah. and a half older. And I was born to be her friend, so everything she did, I did. Because right. um, that's what friends are for, yeah, right? So, absolutely. Uh, so she called him Titsy Paulie. So, you know, for most of his <laughs> life, he was Titsy. Titsy. <laughs> titsy. And he never got offended, right? He just yeah, said, oh, nah, yeah. he was a nice old guy, you know, Titsy. <laughs> and he was a psychic, and, you know, I used to watch him go into his, you know. So I remember that and Italian folk songs. And, and then when I left Brooklyn in Queens, that's when we had backyards. We lived on the bottom floor, and the music was always spilling in everybody's backyards because everybody had their square or rectangle, and, and the wild, the wild things that you saw. You just saw, saw like little snapshots of everyone's life, and I took care of my grandmother's garden, and there was a lady across, and, and she used to work all day, and she'd be making her sauce because you know. And, you always, everybody made sauce on Sunday was a big thing. Yeah. You know, it was a ritual. And after she was done with everything around 2 o'clock, she'd come out and sit in a little wooden fold-up chair and play accordion. She was a very large woman with very large arms that draped over this accordion. And she would always play volare, which yeah. means my heart has wings. Yeah. And it was always wild to see her wings flapping there <laughs> on that accordion and hear this woman trapped in this kind of life you know, meanwhile, I was listening to Joni Mitchell and the Beatles and Joplin and Lottie Lania and yeah. The Doors and Jimi Hendrix, who was such a huge influence in my life. And um, I, uh, I just, I, I remember seeing the contrast in that and and thinking, I got to get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and um, and so. Um, I uh, I always had one foot in a different world and one foot in where everyone else was. And so I thought, um, you know, listening to all of that stuff, it's funny. I, I was listening to Lottie Lania. I was listening to people sing Kurt Weill songs. And the yeah. Doors, of course, sang Kurt Weill. And, and remarkably, I'm singing Kurt Weill, Weill music. Okay, and, and I love it. And it's not, opera, yeah. I'm doing three great. penny opera. It's a rock because he was, a, you know, um, he was a nonconformist. Yeah. And um, this play is, he was also a communist and thrown out of three different countries. But yeah. you know who's counting? Um, and, right. um, and he was a vegan. Yeah. And um, and the irony about this play is that Alan gives a speech, which is it written. You know, Mac the Knife uh, gives a speech at the end about. Um, what the difference is that there are modest criminals um, with a use, that, who use their hands breaking into modest cash registers, and and um, and and what the difference is between a fellow who robs a bank and one who founds a bank, yeah. and um, it, it kind of brings up all the SNL and um, Enron stuff for me. You yeah, know? absolutely. And and. The fact that the whole play, to me, my role is definitely betrayal, you know. Yeah. Um, and and you kind of, I, I I looked at this whole play wondering, well, you, you go through this journey every night, you know, when you sing music, and you lift people's vibrations, that's a whole different thing. You know, you do a sad song, you you lift them up again. You know, 
you poke them in the eye, you ch -ch -ch -ch, and then you lift them up, and you make them think that way. But this play is a journey, and I'm a character, so it's a whole different thing. Yeah. And so I wondered about that character, and I realized that we are living in times of great betrayal, and it's all over the place. It's in our government. It's in our our everything we do. You know, doggy dog. You know, yeah. and it's it doesn't have to be. And this examines that, and to see that nothing's really changed from 1928 to now, yeah, is extraordinary because. The translation that Wally Shawn had has done is very much in keeping with what it was. I mean, I have a book, an old old book from the original um, translations, yeah. and it's very close. Except that Wally used some profanity because in those days, what Brecht was talking about was shocking. This play right. was shocking. It had 19 performances. It ran for 19 performances. And it's such a classic now, it's incredible. Well, you know, there's many versions, like in the 50s, Lottie Lania came, and they did the McCarthyism version, which was really milk toast. Right, and I mean, they think about the time. I mean, changed the music, yeah. changed the lyrics of the music to real, like, I'm so glad I don't have to sing those lyrics. Yeah. That would kill me. Um, these lyrics are much more biting, more challenging, tell a better story. Yeah. And ironically, I was not supposed to do this role. Be I think it's ironic because as I sing the Solomon song, in it, it everyone, you know, his wisdom didn't bring him too much fun. You know, her beauty didn't bring him too much fun. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, because girls, <laughs> they want to have fun. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> right. but um, no, uh, I, I think that, I think I was supposed to do this role. And, and, and it was just because the tour ended and it happened to, you know, Edie Falco happened to drop out and, yeah. you know, but now being in it, I, I realized that I, I was really destined to do this. And um, and Alan Cumming is amazing. He's a great actor, and has been unbelievable to work with on stage. And the yeah. stage performers are very different. You know, in film, you have a scene and it's a heavy scene, and you do it and it's done. Right. And then you don't you don't do it again. But this is every night you take yeah, the exactly. same journey down. Yeah. You know, it starts out kind of funny, and then it goes. Oh, it goes south, you know. Yeah. But it's remarkable to to do a play like this that makes people think, yeah. and really, it, it's in your face. It's it's kind of like an anti musical, yeah. The way it's done because it's not about you know the big musical dance number and and making people escape from their feelings like musicals sometimes do. Well, it takes you on a journey. Absolutely. But you definitely you have to think. Yeah. yeah. And and I am so proud to be part of um, a play like that because, you know, at this point in my life, or at any point in my life, I didn't have a lot of time for fluff. Yeah. And right. I think as a rock and roller, it's kind of your obligation to rock out. It is. I agree. <laughs> and even though it's a ballad, it kicks your butt. Yeah. You know, or if it's a... Nellie Mackay is is wonderful. She is great. I know Nellie. She's, she's really great. Yeah. And in this, she's really great. And it's it's funny that it's she and I and Alan, who you don't think of Alan as a typical Broadway person. You think of him as like a rocker. When I first met him, he had like a half mohawk. Yeah. And it's like you know, I kind of understood that right away because. I remember in 1983, Todd Rundgren was sitting on the other side of me, and he goes, Sin, what happened? You only got half a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Todd said that. That's funny. Well, he, no, I think he's, he's a rocker. He's rocking. Um, I, I think um, there's, I love music. I feel so lucky that I was able to do all the things that I've, I've done. I, you know, just recently, I you know I was working with Rock Wilder, f uh, we're yeah. working on some stuff together, and um, and Dion Warwick walked into the studio, and uh, and I was like, oh my God, I haven't seen you since you know God knows when, and I said, well, how are you doing, and blah blah blah, and and she said she was doing this record um, of duets of her songbook, and I said, 
wow, she said, would you be interested in singing on? I was like, Pope Catholic? You know, yeah, right, I, exactly. And I remember as a little kid doing laundry in the basement, you know, um, with a little transistor radio, singing this one song with her, um, Message to Michael. Message to Michael, yeah. Which I loved. Great and track. Um, I asked her if anyone was doing that one. She said no. And to actually be able to, as an adult, what an extraordinary life. Yeah. To Come sing up with someone that. Someone you loved when you were younger, their music. And, and then sing it with him. And let me tell you, her voice. Yeah. Still rocking. Yeah. And her harmonies. The woman's incredible. She's great. Now, Cindy, you, I first saw you play live um, at City Gardens in Trenton, New Jersey with your band Blue, Blue Angel. Blue Angel. And you were killing it on stage. You were great. I mean, you were, you were really putting on. I remember going, wow, she's kicking ass up there. I still kick some. I know you do. But tell me, I mean, that was, tell me about how you got together with Blue Angel. Was that the, I mean, that was obviously the first band you were signed with. Yeah. I, I was with many bands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and then we were with, we had many versions of Blue Angel. And then, but it was mostly John Tory that I wanted to work with. He had worked with a group called Bulldog with Billy Hawker and uh, Dino Dinelli and, yeah. um, oh my God, how could I forget his name, the bass player? He was really great, yeah. great voice. Anyway, from the Rascals. Yeah, and, and Dino's from them. Was yeah, great. and Dino yeah. was the drummer. And um, yeah. so, oh, and Eric Thorn uh, Thorndren, who yeah. um, later went on to produce the Eurythmics. And, yeah. You know, he, he's a really wonderful producer. Talented and I producer. worked with him, yeah. yeah. And, um, and so uh, I, I wanted to work with Johnny, and um, and we did a lot of writing together, like Rockabilly, which I fell in love with. I, I was in these cover bands, and I always got fired because <laughs> <laughs> you know I didn't do well. I never did well. Yeah, I was I was too small, and I moved like a boy. I moved around too much, and they wanted me to stand still. And there was this one girl who did very well. Her name was Sandy, and she was very well endowed, and, and she would stand, you know, proud and sing, you know, and, and they would say, why can't you stand still and sing? I remember trying to stand still on the stage and sing, and all of a sudden I found myself with one foot off of the stage and one on, and I just couldn't even negotiate how I was going <laughs> to get back to what level. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, know, right. you know, so, and, and that and, and the time that I imitated the death of a cockroach was just wrong. It really pissed yeah. off the owner, you know. <laughs> but there was only like 12 people in the club and I said, hey, yeah. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <You know>? That's great. <laughs> now, what we used to play Hitsville, which we actually called Shitsville. Shitsville, um, yeah. You know, because it was kind there of was Shitsville, jumping. Shitsville North and Shitsville South. That's it. That's, it. That's right. <laughs> And, and in the back of the walls, it would say, you know, are we not signed? No, we are demo, D-E-M-O. Right, because you know? of Devo and everything. Because everybody was saying Devo funny, in the yeah. day, yeah. And, and, um, and so, you know, one, one New Year's, when we were first signed, I had just dyed my hair. I always remember from what hair color I had yeah. or what I was wearing at the time, what year yeah. it was. And, um, and I, it, we were opening for Kid Creole and the Coconuts, and... It was so exciting, and we were on our way, and it was big. It was the Ritz, and it was big, and Polydor was rare, and it was, we were going, we were going, and the next year we were just gone. We were yeah. not doing well. We were at Shitsville, yeah. and we were doing the New Year's show in this club off of Route 14 or some, something like yeah. that, and um, I remember I just, like, spray painted my hair blue and I remember going on stage singing I'll have a blue Christmas and I heard one girl go she's drunk and I'm thinking well not yet but I will, <laughs> but it will be as <laughs> soon as this night's over <laughs> Polydor was a hard label to like really break At through on time, in those days yeah. yeah because they wanted me to be a copy of someone else yeah and um and I didn't I remember they took me out to work with Giorgio Moroda and he wanted me to do this song, Roadie, and sound like Deborah Harry. And yeah. I said, I think you ought to get Deborah Harry. Right. Because I can't do Deborah. And, and I also felt like that would be, you know, betrayal. Right. <laughs> um, right. No, big betrayal. Because I'm a singer and she's a singer. And if, if they want her to do something that she didn't want to do, and then they're just going to get a sound alike to do it, yeah. I thought that that was a low blow, so I would never do that. I don't and blame you, because he, he had done Call Me With Her, and before that he'd done the Donna Summer stuff, so he, you yeah. know. So, right. so they couldn't believe that I wouldn't listen. Yeah. I've always been very strong 
that's well, cool though. That's one of the things that makes you special and individual. Yeah, well, special. I don't know. <laughs> it's always nice to be referred as special. Yeah. Then they found Depends a new. They, they found a new word for me. Then they <laughs> was like, she's so unusual. Yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of which, what? that record, of course, and doing the solo thing, mm. great record. All the songs on there. You ended up working with Rick Chertoff and the guys from Philly. How did you get hooked up with that whole Philly? crew the guys also from the Hooters and well Dave Wolf knew Lenny Pizzi um, who knew Rick Chertoff and I guess I must have been like the demon out of hell for them because I always said listen if it's gonna say Cindy Lauper on top and you in the back is the producer then it's my music yeah. I said but if it says Rick Chertoff and me in the back is singer then it's your music <laughs> right and so I said, but it's my picture, so it's my music. In those days, you know, they would say, we have our quota yeah. of women, or um, if she has a big voice, let her sing. Why should she write, you know? I and then, um, so I had to arm wrestle them to let me write time after time. And while I was writing it, I was, you know, like a true Sicilian. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm half Sicilian, I'm yeah. little Sicilian, so like a true Sicilian, I'm sitting there thinking, and I hope that it becomes such a classic that you never forget, and you never f do this to somebody else, and you always, and then you always <laughs> hear this song, and you never forget. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Meanwhile, I feel that hand on my shoulder, and all of a sudden, the lyrics fall into place, and me, and I say, ah, yes, <laughs> grasshopper, if yeah. you're lost, you can look, and you will find, if you fall, I will catch you, yes, of course, what must go goes yeah. up must come down, yeah. of course, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and then, um, I, you know, we, we, we did it, and it was really a magical experience, and Rick was so protective of that song, and everyone loved that song, and, and it was remarkable that it did become a hit song, but it was, kind of like such a, a Sicilian thing to do yeah. while you're writing. <laughs> but you know, what can I tell you? It was a life lesson for me because that song constantly taught me lessons. It was up for a Grammy for best song. It didn't win. And the song that did win, I never heard a cover of. But I heard so yeah. many covers of time after time. Yeah, well, you time know? after time is, is such a brilliant song. It's a beautiful song. And it's, well, it's funny and it's because timeless. I it's timeless. Still, it's still, every time you hear it, it's just... It was very dreamlike. It was about a dream, yeah. you know, and, and, um, and Rob's life and, and, and my life and kind of put together. I, I had a conversation with him, as I do sometimes. I'll talk to the person I'm going to write with and ask them questions and write down what they say because I believe in lyrics being um, colloquialisms as people speak so that you're recording the time in the song yeah. and how people speak, you know. Absolutely. Like even when I wrote Hat Full of Stars, I, I called my mom and I said, how's it going? And she goes, oh, it's going in dribs and drabs. And I was like, oh my God, it's going in dribs and drabs. That's brilliant, Mom. Yeah. I got work that one I'm going to use that line. That's <laughs> great. You know, um, and, and even with Rick, you know, his, his, his watch was unwinding. His watch was going backwards in the studio when we were doing it. And uh, all he kept saying was, oh, my God, look at the second hand. It's going backwards. My watch is unwinding. And I said, the second hand unwinds. Oh, my God. And so that became a lyric. So yeah. that it was a piece of everything that happened around me. And I put in the song. And the title was insignificant because it was you know it was like uh, why don't you just write a whole bunch of titles and just you know try them out so I opened up the TV guide and I just started writing titles of movies yeah and time after time was one of them and I never thought it would be you know the title but when I tried to take it out it wouldn't come out you know yeah. like it, the song fell apart so I was like Okay, so so leave it, you know. Yeah. And it just it had a life of its own. Your songs deserve different treatments as well. I mean, obviously, uh, F, you know, she's so unusual. Sold about nine million records, I think, in the states alone. Uh, how did you go about picking the people that you worked with? I thought it was cool like, that you picked individuals like Sarah McLachlan ended up working, Ani DeFranco. Um, tell me about how you came across the people that you worked with on that record and did singing with you. Well. 
I'm lazy, <laughs> so I chose some friends. <laughs> yeah, well, that's cool. I chose people that I knew that I really liked. I mean, I, I love Sarah McLaughlin, and I had met her at a songwriting convention once. Um, and she was very cool. I, of course, was always very, um, you know, uptight. I, um, some, you know, I, I don't do well with suits. Yeah. <laughs> it's very hard for yeah. me. Um, and, uh, and, and Sarah was just like, you know, whatever. And so I asked her if, um, if she would sing. She had liked this track that I had sung, Water's Edge. And that's what the original song I wanted her to sing on. And somehow it got back to her that, you know, I wanted her to sing on Time After Time. And I said, hey, <laughs> it's yeah. Sarah McGuire, I don't care if she could sing Do Re Mi. Come yeah. on over. Yeah. And, um, and I had been playing this stuff anyway live. And I figured, you know, it was suggested to me that I do an 80s cover record. And I suggested back that I would rather cover my own music, which was bigger than some of the 80s songs that they were showing me. Absolutely. And Yours so, were big enough to represent. I so, think that's true. So then they said, yeah, that would be really great. And why don't you do them the way you play them live? And I thought about it. And I thought, wow, how lucky am I? This was extraordinary that I would be able to play and sing when I was signed as a singer, had to fight to be able to write, and then now be offered to play and sing things that you wrote, and you write back to when you started as a kid, you know? Yeah. So it was a great opportunity, and Shaggy I met in Holland, and he was out of his mind. He's a cool play. guy, Shaggy. He's very talented. Yeah. And I, he played me some of his new stuff, and I, I loved it uh, so much. Uh, he played me this uh, track where angels, when angels sleep, and um, it was about an abused child. And I thought, whoa, you know. And, and here's a guy who supports the only children's hospital in the Caribbean. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I thought, man, this guy is so cool, and he has a pirate smile and yeah. a great soul. And I thought, yeah. I want to sing with him, and um, I actually got to do VH1 thing with him, um, and he sang two tracks with me, and I sang one of his tracks, and 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 I actually climbed on his back. I'll never forget his <laughs> face when I climbed on his back. He was like, and he was so funny. He's he's such a great guy, and his energy. I knew that he would understand if I said, you know what, Shags, let's do a folk Jamaican pop rock kind of thing, yeah. you know. Uh, my main um, objective with my music over the years has been to integrate all of the different kinds of stylistic music that I used to hear on one radio station, which has now been car um, put in little boxes. Like You're you, right, all the sub-genres. You cannot listen to everything together. It's almost like segregation. Our yeah. music has been segregated, and it has always been a dream of mine and an ambition to bring it back yeah. together because every kind of music influences every kind of music. And you can't have it separate because once you have it separate, then that's where you start controlling people and their minds and their brains and how they think because everything is controlled. And I think you need a little bit of anarchy for yeah, growth. You surely do. And so especially it's been the rock. best thing for music, you know. That's right. So so my, this album to bring Ani DeFranco and Vivian Green together on one song yeah, about and Vivian's them, great singer. About the um, disenfranchisement of women and have her yeah. sing Sisters of Avalon. I mean when I was singing yeah. I was singing in front of the cauldron and playing the guitar and yeah. it was such a great journey to work with Rick again, Rick Chertoff and Jamie Westorham from yeah. the Fix. I yeah. went over to England and I did something in England that I've never done because you're not allowed. Because yeah. every time you play the television shows that you have to sing to track or you have to do this. You, but I mixed a live thing. I yeah. was actually able that's to play cool live. That's cool that you did that because that's that union thing they have over there with no, the BBC. No, 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 but, but now it's live. And wow. I took the dulcimer and the guitar and I mixed it together with the track so that it would sound live. Yeah. And Because all the tracks were live. So, of course, you hear the leakage. Yeah. So um, that's how I played them. And I was so excited to be able to do that. And I was able to mix the R&B from Vivian Green, um, the alternative of, um, of Ari DeFranco and right. Adam Lazaro. Adam from Taking Back Sunday, that's great right. guy. And, that's and right. I really and, like those guys. And um, 
and Jeff Beck. All my yeah. life as, as a kid, I would listen to Jeff Beck. You and love say, them with the Yardbirds, right? And oh, come know, on. Yeah. And, and how about the Truth album and the, the Beck album. Ola Beck Ola, album. yeah. Come on. And, Rough and, and Ready, all that stuff. To yeah. be able to sing and write with him. And this yeah. song, it came, it was like one of those songs like Time After Time came. Yeah. It, 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 I heard this track and then all of a sudden I, I heard the lyric and, and I understand the melody and what it was supposed to be. And I, I took poor Jed, Jed Lieber and I said, hey pal, just, just go to the piano now and okay. start playing. And, and I said, just, just follow me. Uh, this is coming and this is it. It's coming and it's gonna be gone. So I just wrote without questioning, I did question myself a little and I said, forget it. And I just wrote everything down. Didn't make sense to me while I was writing it. When I read it back, it was perfectly clear. Yeah, it's great. Well, you know, you, you have a great legacy of music and you keep doing your thing, which I love. You stay true to yourself. Trying. All this time, you know. And Trying. I love that Three Penny Opera, like we said, is doing great. Now people should definitely check that out. I think it's rock and play. I think it, it, it's, it's um, for people who like to still think, you know, the numbing down of America is yeah. pretty amazing. But it's amazing how something so old can be so on the money right now. Yeah. Well, it's true how certain things come up in human behavior and the way that people are. and the Things way that, never change. Yeah, things don't the more change. They, the more they change, the more, the more they, they stay, stay the, the same. same yeah. Right? Absolutely. Cindy, thanks again for coming by. It was really great to have you. Of course, you know, you always, everybody made sauce on Sunday. It was a big thing. Yeah. You know, it was a ritual. And after she was done with everything around 2 o'clock, she'd come out and sit in a little wooden fold-up chair and play accordion. She was a very large woman with very large arms that draped over this accordion. And she would always play volare, which yeah. means my heart has wings. Yeah. And it was always wild to see her wings flapping there yeah. on that accordion and hear this woman trapped in this kind of life. You know, meanwhile, I was listening to Joni Mitchell and the Beatles and Joplin and Lottie Lania and yeah. The Doors and Jimi Hendrix who was such a huge influence in my life and um, I, uh, I just, I, I remember seeing the contrast in that and, and thinking I gotta get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, um, and so um, I, uh, I always had one foot in a different world and one foot in where everyone else was. And so I thought, um, you know, listening to all of that stuff, it's funny, I, I was listening to Lottie Lania, I was listening to people sing Kurt Vile songs, and The yeah. Doors, of course, sang Kurt Vile, and, and remarkably, I'm singing Kurt Vile music, <laughs> and, and I love it. And it's not, opera, yeah, I'm doing Three great. Penny Opera. It's a rock because he was, a, you know, um, he was a nonconformist. Yeah. And um, this play is, he was also a communist and thrown out of three different countries, but, yeah. you know, who's counting? Um, and, right. um, and he was a vegan. Yeah. And, um, and the irony about this play is that Alan gives a speech, which is it written, you know, Mac the Knife uh, gives a speech at the end about. Um, what the difference is that there are modest criminals um, with a use, th who use their hands breaking into modest cash registers, and and um, and and what the difference is between a fellow who robs a bank and one who founds a bank, yeah. and um, it, it kind of brings up all the SNL and um, Enron stuff for me. You yeah, know? absolutely. And and. The fact that the whole play, to me, my role is definitely betrayal, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and you kind of, I, I, I looked at this whole play wondering, well, you, you go through this journey every night, you know, when you sing music and you lift people's vibrations, that's a whole different thing. You know, you do a sad song, you, you lift them up again, you know, you poke them in the eye, and then you lift them up, and you make them think that way. But this play is a journey, and I'm a character, so it's a whole different thing. Yeah. And so I wondered about that character, and I realized that we are living in times of great betrayal, and it's all over the place. It's in our government. It's in our, our a, everything we do. You know, doggy dog. You know, yeah. and it's it doesn't have to be. And this examines that, and to see that nothing's really changed from 1928 to now, yeah, is extraordinary because. The translation that Wally Shawn has, has done is very much in keeping with what it was. 
I mean, I have a book, an old, old book from the original um, translations, yeah. and it's very close, except that Wally used some profanity because in those days, what Brecht was talking about was shocking. This play right. was shocking. It had 19 performances. It ran for 19 performances. And it's such a classic now. It's incredible. Well, you know, there's many versions. Like in the 50s, Lottie Lania came, and they did the McCarthyism version, which was really milk toast. Right. And I mean, think about the time. I mean, changed the music, yeah. changed the lyrics of the music to real, like, I'm so glad I don't have to sing those lyrics. Yeah. That would kill me. Um, these lyrics are much more biting, more challenging, tell a better story. Yeah. And ironically, I was not supposed to do this role. Be I think it's ironic because as I sing the Solomon song, in it, it everyone, you know, his wisdom didn't bring him too much fun. You know, her beauty didn't bring him too much fun. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, because girls, <laughs> they want to have fun. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> right. but um, no, uh, I, I think that, I think I was supposed to do this role. And, and, and it was just because the tour ended and it happened to, you know, Edie Falco happened to drop out and, yeah. you know, but now being in it, I, I realized that I, I was really destined to do this. And um, and Alan Cumming is amazing. He's a great actor, and has been unbelievable to work with on stage. And the yeah. stage performers are very different. You know, in film, you have a scene and it's a heavy scene, and you do it and it's done. Right. And then you don't you don't do it again. But this is every night you take yeah, the exactly. same journey down. Yeah. You know, it starts out kind of funny, and then it goes. Oh, it goes south, you know. Yeah. But it's remarkable to to do a play like this that makes people think, yeah. and really, it, it's in your face. It's it's kind of like an anti musical, yeah. The way it's done because it's not about you know the big musical dance number and and making people escape from their feelings like musicals sometimes do. Well, it takes you on a journey. Absolutely. But you definitely you have to think. Yeah. yeah. And and I am so proud to be part of um, a play like that because, you know, at this point in my life, or at any point in my life, I didn't have a lot of time for fluff. Yeah. And <laughs> I think as a rock and roller, it's kind of your obligation to rock out. <laughs> it is. I agree. <laughs> and even though it's a ballad, it kicks your butt. Yeah. You know, or if it's a... Nellie Mackay is is wonderful. She is great. I know Nellie. She's, Nellie's, she's really great. Yeah. And in this, she's really great. And it's it's funny that it's she and I and Alan, who you don't think of Alan as a typical Broadway person. You think of him. You grew up in Brooklyn in that area. What was it, what are your first memories of, of the music that you loved? Did you did you listen to ABC and MCA and those stations that the New York radio stations back in those days? Well, in Brooklyn it was Williamsburg, and I grew up right across the street from the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And my first recollection was sailors and and women in you know those really crazy fifties fashions and. Half of it, one block was Italian, the other Spanish, and the other was Hasidic, which was really exotic to me because the men, of course, looked dressier than the women. You know, it was like a punk look, but I didn't realize it was punk then. But I was very attracted to that look. You know, the white socks, the short pants. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, mostly sailors, and 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 um, and the guy that lived upstairs from me was, um, you know, Italian. We were all Italian families, and. Um, and the lady that took care of me, her husband was a psychic, so I just, the visual was pretty intense. It was always like, you know, the wall of saints, and everyone would come to him to find out what was going to happen. And his, it was supposed to call him Sitsi Pauli, but yeah. I couldn't pronounce it. Basically, my sister couldn't. So whatever my sister Ellen did, I did. She was a year yeah. and a half older. And I was born to be her friend, so everything she did, I did. Because right. um, that's what friends are for, yeah, right? So, absolutely. Uh, so she called him Titsy Pauly. So, you know, for most of his <laughs> life, was he was Titsy. Titsy. <laughs> hey, titsy. And he never got offended, right? He just yeah, said, oh, nah, yeah. he was a nice old guy, you know, Titsy. <laughs> and he was a psychic, and, you know, I used to watch him go into his, you know. So I remember that and Italian folk songs. And, and then when I left Brooklyn in Queens, 
that's when we had backyards. We lived on the bottom floor, and the music was always spilling in everybody's backyards because everybody had their square or rectangle, and, and the wild, the wild things that you saw. You just saw, saw like little snapshots of everyone's life, and. I took care of my grandmother's garden and there was a lady across and, and she used to work all day and she'd be making her sores like a rocker. When I first met him, he had like a half mohawk. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I kind of understood that right away because I remember in 1983, <laughs> Todd Rundgren was sitting on the other side of me and he goes, Sin, what happened? You only got half a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Todd said that. That's funny. Well, he no. I think he's he's a rocker. He's rocking. Um, I, I think um, there's. I love music. I feel so lucky that I was able to do all the things that I've I've done. I, you know, just recently, I you know I was working with Rock Wilder, f uh, yeah. working on some stuff together, and um, and Dion Warwick walked into the studio and uh, and I was like, oh my God, I haven't seen you since, you know, God knows when. And I said, well, how you doing? And blah, blah, blah. And, and she said she was doing this record um, of duets of her songbook. And I said, wow. She said, w would you be interested in singing one? I was like, Pope Catholic? You know, yeah, right, I, exactly. And I remember as a little kid doing laundry in the basement, you know, um, with a little transistor radio singing this one song with her, um, Message to Michael. Message to Michael, yeah. Which I loved. Great and track. Um, I asked her if anyone was doing that one. She said no. And to actually be able to, as an adult, what an extraordinary life, yeah. to Come back sing to that. Come you loved when you were younger, their music. And, and then sing it with him. And let me tell you, her voice, yeah, still rocking. Yeah. And her harmonies, the woman's incredible. She's great. Now, Cindy, you, I first saw you play live um, at City Gardens in Trenton, New Jersey with your band Blue, Blue Angel. Blue Angel. And you were killing it on stage. You were great. I mean, you were, you were really putting on. I remember going, wow, she's kicking ass up there. I still kick some. I know you do. But tell me, I mean, that was, tell me about how you got together with Blue Angel. Was that the, I mean, that was obviously the first band you were signed with. Yeah. I, I was with many bands. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and then we were with, we had many versions of Blue Angel 